Good morning, everyone. My name is Philippe Huberdo. I'm the Secretary General of Scale Up Europe, and I'm very excited to welcome you to this first of uh, four workshops of this great initiative. Uh, we have the instrumental support of our partners from uh, European Startup Networks, Roland Berger, the French Tech, Station F, Viva Tech, Hello Tomorrow, and Sifted. And furthermore, over the last months, more than 150 scale-ups, investors, associations joined the initiative. So this is a really an ecosystemic process driven by the actors of the tech, for the actors of the tech, to help accelerate the emergence of the next tech giants in Europe. I'm very grateful that Erzilia, Chief Digital Officer of the European Space Agency, and uh, Jean-Charles, who is a co-founder and CEO of Alan, are joining us again today after the digital launch of uh, last month. I would also like to welcome uh, warmly and to express my deepest thanks to uh, the founders and CEOs of Unicorns who are joining us today. So all together, this is a very impressive lineup. Our discussion today will focus on talents and future of work. And I'm very grateful that Roxanne from Station F and, Ronan Be uh, and Stephanie from Ron Berger accepted to bring all the expertise to the discussion. Before turning to them, I would like just to recall our goal, which is to elaborate very concrete recommendations for accelerating the tech in Europe with a view to consolidate its sovereignty, sustainability, and prosperity, which all together will form a manifesto that will be then afterwards pushed at the European level by President Macron. So without further ado, I'm turning to, to Stephanie. Up to you, Stephanie. Sure, thank you very much. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I'm going to just briefly introduce the workshop today. So why are we meeting? Today is all about winning the battle for startup talent. After one month of open consultation, we've already, we've already developed and identified a promising set of recommendations that we wanted to share with the community today. The workshop will be organized around three topics, and you see them on the screen. Each topic will about, be about 25 minutes in duration, so we should have some good time to discuss each element. This will leave us enough time, we hope, for both our panel to contribute, uh, as well as our community to comment and share the views. There is a chat on the side, and please, we encourage you to put your questions and share your questions throughout the session via this chat, and we'll be delighted to address those during the Q&A session. That I believe Roxanne is going to introduce the participants today. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, hi, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, we have a terrific panel, as you guys can see on the slide. So just to quickly tell you who's joining us this morning, uh, we have Wanda Antonio, who's the founder and CEO of Cabify, Tavid Hinkrikas, uh, who's CEO and co-founder of WISE, uh, Caroline Hamad, who's founder and CEO of 50 in Tech, Peter Vandedos, who's CEO and co-founder of Adyen, and Hannah Renner, who's the co-founder and CEO of Personio. So I really don't think we could have thought of a better lineup uh, for this morning. I want to say thank you to everybody um, who contributed uh, so far, so we got a lot of really great contributions and we'll obviously get, to get a chance to talk about them uh, briefly. And I also want to thank uh, everybody who's here today for participating. Uh, really great to have you all with us. Um, of course, it's a super, super important topic uh, for, for everybody, so really excited to dive in. I'm going to hand it over to our two co-chairs. Go ahead, Arcelia. Can I go? Okay, okay. Thank you very much. It's really an honor, a pleasure to, to be here. It's, uh, it's very exciting. So let me uh, use my two minutes to tell you that the world of work is changing. And it's not just because what we are uh, undergoing with the pandemic that is uh, uh, in a way accelerating trends 
toward remote work, e-commerce, automation, and so on. But there is something that was already there, and it's important that we grasp the, the, the size of this uh, skill shift that is accompanying the introduction of new technologies in the workplace. Now, what is interesting is, first of all, that the do uh, demand for technological skills that are accelerating due to automation and uh, uh, the introduction of artificial intelligence also require people who understand how they work and can innovate, develop, and adapt them. But the real uh, novelty is the fact that the times to come will also require that these uh, uh, skills, technological skills, should be really uh, accompanied by finely tuned social and emotional skills. There will be a high increase, a high rise in the demand of these skills. In Europe, 22% uh, of uh, the demand for these skills will be associated to technological jobs. So in some way, we see that uh, it's not any longer to be the good one in technology, the good engineer going vertically in his subject, but empathy, ability to communicate, the ability to uh, um, persuade, negotiate, start to be really the things that will make a difference. Also, I mean, because those are the skills that machine are a long way from mastering. So in one way, given that uh, the demand for entrepreneurship and initiative taking will be fast growing, I see that uh, uh, at the moment there is an estimation of a 32% rise in demand of people that have these skills in uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, it's very important uh, that uh, we uh, nail it. Uh, and this starts also from, uh, from education, particularly universities now. Yeah, I think we lost her. Okay, um, so I'm going to take well, over. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> and so, hi everyone. Really, really happy to see you. Um, I'm John Charles, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Palan. We we are a French uh, tech company trying to transform healthcare. We are 350 employees over Europe uh, and growing um, quite quite fast. And while we we have been building the company with employees in many countries in Europe. Um, we, we, we have amazing things there, but we have been also confronted to several blockers. Um, some of them were hard to find the right setup for international newcomers, such as stock options, tax, uh, bank account creation. Um, hard to have a satisf satisfying diversity balance. Uh, we, we have only 20% of our engineering team that are women, which uh, we, we fight to have a diverse leadership team. And although we, we keep expanding, we, we wish that the ecosystem has the proper tools uh, so that our scale-ups can deliver their very ambitious mission and that we can grow internationally, be sovereign in Europe. And that's why winning the battle of talent in our European scale-up is so important, I believe. Um, what makes me really opportunistic is that in the past, when we worked with um, states to improve uh, some scope, it worked. So in France, we managed to edit the stock option uh, framework to make it more competitive versus other countries. And I believe we can do that at the European level. Uh, and thinking a European is the right way because Europe has the potential to mix the best technology, but also a very different set of culture that I think is very differentiated from the US or China and really complementary. If we manage to build that ecosystem at scale, uh, it's going to be uh, really amazing. And in order to do that, we need to remove the blockers that exist, empower companies so they can attract foreign talents everywhere in Europe, but also outside of Europe. And also, as we discussed again with Ercilia, uh, bring in more diversity. So really looking forward to that workshop. Thank you, everyone, uh, to be there. All right. Thanks, uh, Jean-Charles. We hope we'll have Ercilia back with us shortly. Um, you guys can see some of the panelists are joining the stage. So we're about to get started with the first topic. We'll let everybody join. So let's kick off our discussion. I think we couldn't have picked a better topic to start. Diversity, as you guys know, uh, is key to innovation and to creating some of tomorrow's best companies um, and products and services. Um, so thank you to 
everybody for contributing to this discussion. So I think the two areas where um, people seem to agree the most uh, were to set up a European diversity and inclusion guidebook to share the best HR practices with measurable KPIs. Sounds like kind of a no-brainer, but that would be a huge, huge benefit. Um, and also to generalize gender-neutral paternal parental leave uh, through regulation, which has already been acted in some countries. And I think this is something that uh, should, be, should be spread further, and a lot of people seem to agree with that. So awesome. Now, there were some discussion and some, um, I think th these are two great topics to kind of dive into a little bit deeper and see especially what our panelists think, but also to hear from uh, everybody participating this morning. What do you guys think? So these were the two areas that it's not clear. Should we establish a European diversity rating based on mandatory reporting of diversity indicators by companies? This could raise consciousness um, and name virtuous or non-virtuous companies, so kind of a name and shame. Um, and also, second topic is, should we set up a quota for underrepresented groups in recruiting? So for example, uh, final rounds for senior positions, leadership positions. Um, I know that this has been also very controversial in some countries as well. Uh, people get very tense when we talk about quotas, so I'm really excited to hear what our panelists think. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with the panelists and then open it up for questions uh, to the participants. And everybody, please feel free to check out the polls section because there will also be polls that will be posted and we can ask for your feedback throughout the discussion. So I'm gonna kick it off with Caroline. Tell us what you think about diversity ratings and quotas. Totally. <laughs> so, <laughs> hi, everybody. I'm really uh, happy to be uh, with you today. Uh, yeah, so I will say yes uh, to uh, the boss uh, point. Why Why so important? I think diversity is one of the, uh, the priority that we need to go for every tech company. Uh, Jean-Charles said uh, the, the level and the, the pipeline of women, for example, is really tight. We have around 25% of women working in the tech industry. And um, I will give you the voice uh, of women and even from the top level women in tech because we survey them a lot. And one in two women is leaving tech now uh, after eight years of experience due to discrimination. Uh, and even a recent report from D DICE uh, just, uh, um, uh, they just gives the number, it's like 57% of them who have like experienced discrimination. So. This topic is really important because we are losing this great woman and, and diverse profile. Uh, they are experiencing more burnout and so on. And so what they said, uh, they want to know exactly where they are going now. Uh, I was yesterday with an American product in the blockchain industry, amazing woman with 20 years of experience. And she told me that she feels a syndrome of PhD. You know, she don't want to join tech anymore because of that. So. We, not, we need to have transparency and scoring and to know exactly where we are going and, they are, and perhaps choose the best company in order to not lose them anymore. So I think it's a need. And on uh, the second point, the quota, I'm very <laughs> Christine Lagarde, you know, <laughs> fan, and she just told about the quota, but, you know, quota is acceleration. We, we, we can see that nothing, we have no improvement. Uh, so we have more women, of course, more diverse profile but they're feeling bad in the tech industry for now. So we need improvement, we need quota, uh, and I will give you two examples so that we have in France with great results. Um, first, uh, so for, is the low copy Zimmerman. Before that, everybody was saying, we have no women, they can't like integrate um, board, um, they can be board member. Why? Because they have no skills for that. So we have not enough women with the skills to, for, to integrate the board, uh, the, uh, as a board member. And finally, when the law come, like it was three years ago, finally we had this 40% of women coming from everywhere. So they, they know about what is to be a board member because before that they didn't know what it was about the role. And so we have trainings uh, and we have the opportunity because there is a lot of women who can integrate um, so as a board member. So I, I think, uh, in the tech industry, we have 5% of C-level, 1% of CTO. So if we have no incitation, I think uh, we can wait like 200 years without improvement. So quota is acceleration. It's not forever uh, that 
and for women, they say perhaps sometimes, I don't want to be integrated because of the quota. I'm just, I have the skills to integrate. But for now, we can see that we have a Brexit, uh, really a glass ceiling, and we need to break it globally. Super. Thank you, Karen. And you made me laugh with your 200 years of no change. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to all the participants, please feel free to add your questions to the questions section. Uh, Juan, I'd love to hear from you. Do you agree with what Karen just said? She kind of said yes to both uh, diversity rating and quotas. What do you think? Um, well, uh, diversity has many dimensions, of course. Uh, gender is, is, is one of them, uh, but there are many others, many other dimensions, whether people come from rural backgrounds, urban backgrounds, or um, the, 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 how accommodated their income or their wealth is, right? Uh, and most people uh, who start companies, especially tech companies, come from wealthy backgrounds. So I, I, I would love to, to frame this issue uh, more broadly and, and talk about barriers to entry that uh, put off uh, outsiders into uh, starting their own businesses. No, we have to recognize how strong. Europe is in terms of uh, having a, a wealth, uh, welfare. Um, well, we are welfare states, uh, and, and we need to protect that going forward. But that doesn't mean protecting uh, has not to be confused with protecting incumbents or protecting the establishment. I think that's what we need to talk about when we talk about uh, technology uh, and and uh, diversity, because we need to reduce the burden that people perceive. Uh, outsiders, especially considering that diversity concept, outsiders um, by being put up. No, today uh, incorporating a company, uh, especially in technology, has a lot of uh, means a lot of difficulties, and uh, I think there are proposals to make sure that you can incorporate a company in one day in, in, in every country. But then you also have to face regulatory challenges um, and, and maybe creating exemptions, exemptions and regulatory sandboxes will uh, make it more likely for people who are outsiders, who do not come from wealthy backgrounds, who do not care or who have to care about the family, sorry, to, to take that step, to decide to, to, to jump, uh, jump uh, on board. No? Uh, regarding quotas, I'd like to frame it in, I mean, in, in our company, we try to make sure that uh, there is a quota in the last states, so people have to gender quotas specifically people have access to to those positions but i i like to see instead of quotas more incentives or um yeah more more carrots than a stick having support having incentives uh to to encourage companies uh to to generate more more diversity um i think that that would be more uh helpful wonderful so Kind of a bit of a mixed opinion. Uh, wonderful. So let's move now to Peter. I'd love to know what is uh, what is your opinion on the two topics. Um, yeah, that's. Um, I agree that we uh, that progress has been too slow. So uh, we have been looking at many different ways of speeding that up. Um, if you look at um, quota, we have we have in so many countries officers. Uh, this is this is very controversial in some countries because uh, people who are uh, underrepresented feel that we take something away from them if uh, if we install quota. So we discussed it, uh, but I find a huge resistance to it. So um, I'm more of a fan of making sure. Uh, I, I I do think it's way too slow. So we need to think about ways how we can uh, how we can get quicker progress. But I also don't. Uh, um, it's also difficult to. Uh, um, uh, there's a, there's a huge resistance from uh, from people that made a career, um, and then now suddenly feel that they're being that they're being looked upon as if yes, I'm a female country manager, and that is because of a quota. So uh, please don't do that because you're damaging me. That's that's the that's the feedback which I get. Um, we are looking at how, who do we enter in the recruitment process. So you have to to compensate. Underrepresent, uh, underrepresented group by overrepresenting them in your recruitment process, uh, so that you so that uh, you give uh, at at the entrance of the process uh, way more visibility to underrepresented groups. Another thing which we find really important, and that's about uh, the diversity strategy, it's about inclusion. 
Um, because if your company is not inclusive, then diversity will not work. And what we looked at that inclusion is how we promote how people's career progress, on which factors is that done? Is that done on favoritism? Or are we, are we judging people for their contribution? Um, and that's where we made, uh, where I think we made a lot of impact by um, setting clear expectations, how we judge people, make it more objective, and therefore giving more uh, a more fair chance uh, to everyone so that we make our company uh, more inclusive because diversity without being inclusive doesn't work. That's an excellent point. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing that. Um, and it sounds like quotas can somehow be a double-edged sword if, if I understood what you said correctly. Um, now, before I move to Ursilia um, to hear your thoughts on this, I just want to remind everybody uh, who's participating that you guys can ask questions in the question section. So go ahead and make your way over there if you have something you want to ask the panelists. Uh, Ursilia, what do you think? I think it'd be great to get another feminine perspective. Hi, thank you. Sorry for before. Uh, you know, one thing that I've learned as chief diversity officer is that diversity is felt by many. Uh, companies as an additional risk. Uh, they always prefer go for familiarity because you know how to manage it and you know what to expect from that. So there is not a natural uh, understanding and tendency to include uh, people that are different from you. So I, and this is uh, with gender, we see that uh, although we are talking uh, about the, the matter of gender equality since long time, there are no progresses uh, to 254 years before we can reach uh, gender equality in economy. So there is the need uh, of an extra push. And uh, I agree uh, that when the system doesn't go naturally in a direction, you, you need to do something stronger. Uh, I. I agree with Quota uh, in the way that it obliges to face the issue, uh, it obliges to go and look for the right talents instead of just saying, ah, but there is no one out there. And uh, I really believe that probably we need to impress a new gear and the Quota will also mean to start to have a critical mass so that we don't have to face the problem. Uh, in the same way. Let me also say that uh, uh, something uh, uh, will probably uh, change. I, I agree that uh, uh, diversity without inclusion will not be uh, successful, and this is where the main effort should be. But on the other side, I think that diversity is anyway uh, a reality now. It's anyway there. It's not just the right things to do. It's not just the smart things to do. But there is a, there is a pressure toward diversity and in, in different uh, in different aspects. But in particular with gender, this is something that we should tackle with more. Uh, uh, with more force and strength because we cannot go on in just uh, uh, accepting that uh, there is not a fair representation of women uh, everywhere. Super, thank you, Arcelia. Uh We have a shy audience. They haven't asked a ton of questions. Guys, go ahead and ask more questions. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to turn it to Tavet. Tavet, I'd love to hear what you think, not only about quotas, because we've kind of really concentrated on quotas, but also a diversity ranking. Hey everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me here. Um, I do think that the diversity issue is hugely important. You know, the, the simplest frame to put on it from a wife point of view is we have 10 million customers around the world, and that's an incredibly diverse group. If the company is not diverse, it's impossible that we can serve our customers well. Um, however, I'm not sure we yet know what are the best ways to tackle it. And everyone is working on it. Too. That's good, but I'm not sure it's it's yet clear what the best solutions are. So when it comes to the two ones that we're debating here, ratings or quotas, I think quotas are very worthy of a discussion. But you know, we've already spoken about the drawbacks and you know, people being labeled I'm the quota candidate. That's I'm not entirely sure that's helpful. So it's worth thinking about it. And uh, but I'm not sure apply like i'm not sure this as a quick fix will actually get us anywhere uh, like i think you know internally in the company in the recruitment process you do need to make sure that uh, you have visibility and that you know kind of what is the level of diversity throughout the process from beginning to end but i'm a i'm a bigger fan of the other other solution which is uh, ratings like i'm a huge believer in transparency 
and making it visible to people how different companies are doing around this, I think will go a long way to helping people make better choices of, I want to go work for this company because they have X percent diverse workforce. So making that visible on the highest level to the world, I think will go a long way. And that will also make sure that companies internally are visible. That will go a long way to having pipeline visibility, et cetera. So I would start with figuring out how to make it visible. And I'm, I'm not sure, like, how do you make, can you rate companies ABC? Not sure, but, you know, let's start with making things visible. Every company will say, hey, here's our overall workforce diversity, diversity uh, statistics. Here is top level. I think that's a great starting point and then we can start developing ratings but you know i think a, a political committee coming up with a rating plan and slamming someone every company it's also tricky you know there are probably also reasons why one company is going to be tilted left or right on the, in terms of how diverse their workforce is that's all from me from on this one Super. Thanks, Tavid. I think your transparency comment really resonated with a lot of people. You can see the thumbs up uh, in the chat. Uh, Hanno, before I turn it over to questions from the audience, I want to hear from you as well, obviously. So can you also please feel free to share on both topics, quotas and uh, transparency? Yeah, so I think I've, I would agree with a lot of what Tavid uh, has just said. I think that if we foster diversity and it's uh, uh, the transparency of diversity and how companies are doing on that, I think we will automatically incentivize our companies to be also scoring well on that topic. And I think when it comes to quotas, I I agree with worthy discussion. I think there's there's we've also um, I'm from Germany originally, although I'm in our Spanish office right now in Madrid. But it is uh, the case that uh, in the, there's certain cases in Germany where also quotas have helped um, establish on board level uh, more active search for for diverse candidates, not just uh, on female, but but certainly on gender diversity. When it comes to um, the quotas on the funnel though or on the, the bottom end of the candidates i'm not sure although we're an IHR tech company with personio and we we can uh, provide a lot of data around diversity and funnel data to our customers i'm not sure whether we can provide a um, european-wide uh, policy around how your, your recruiting funnel has to look like i think we can do that on how many people need to be on the board but i'm not sure we can do it on a diversity funnel so that said if we get to the diversity transparency, uh, as David has pointed out, I think then automatically, and there was, uh, I think, a point from Juan earlier, if we then work on having a, a more diverse funnel at the top and bring in more diverse candidates, we will not at the end say, okay, we're just picking someone diverse at the bottom because there are three great male candidates and one female, and we have to kind of fill up a quota. But if we make sure that the diversity is at the top of the funnel, then we'll select the right kind of people down the line, and uh, we will uh, get great people uh, from from all spectrums uh, if the initial set is diverse because the, the kind of standard deviation of great people is is equally across the different diversity backgrounds and, and i think that's uh, how we've applied it ourselves and found a lot of um, also female executives that are fantastic leaders on our team but not because we applied quarters at the bottom but we made sure that at the beginning uh, we were looking at um, diverse candidates from the get-go. Excellent points. Thank you so much, Hanno. Uh, we have a lot of questions that are coming in, so I'm going to start with a question from Chris, um, which I find kind of a funny question. Building a successful tech company from idea to market success is difficult enough. There are very few people who have the capability of doing this, especially in Europe. How do you factor in diversity when there are so few qualified people on the ground? So essentially, can we have diverse teams when we have such a small talent pool that's qualified? Um, who would like to jump in and respond to Chris's question first? Go ahead, Peter. Um, I think it's uh, first essential to be uh, to resonate with more groups uh, th than a limited uh, obvious group, because otherwise we don't find the talented people. So we are recruiting from all over the world, and we have to be inclusive for everyone. It's not some idol, uh, some uh, some. Uh, view of how we'd like to have impact on the world. It's also a necessity. We need to make sure that everyone from different backgrounds have the opportunity because there is such a need for for especially engineering talent. Um, but we are recruiting for diverse roles from all over the world. So it's not that we have to do this over over and above building a successful company. 
we feel we cannot build a successful company if we are not attractive to a diverse group and if we're not being inclusive and give also people from, an, from diverse backgrounds the opportunity to build a career. Because if you don't, you lose out on those talents and we just cannot afford that. Thanks so much, Peter. Juan, I also saw you unmute. Go ahead. Yes, I was going to build on, on that because that, that same concept applies to, to our economies. No? When we learn a macroeconomic concept, we see the factors of productivity and labor is one of those factors. The challenge we are facing with diversity is that a reduced uh, percentage of, of, of our labor is uh, able to generate value through the creation of, of these companies because we are not uh, communicating to, to the other parts of society that they can also do that or we are not supporting them uh, enough. So it's key for the progress of our societies that we maximize that factor of productivity that is uh, labor by uh, making sure that uh, they, they can or we can reach our full potential. No? So it, it, within companies is relevant, but for our societies, making sure that uh, founders come from very diverse uh, background is of paramount relevance for, for our countries. Super. And Jean-Charles, I can see you want to jump in. Yeah, uh, I'd like to follow up because we started very, very badly at Alan. The first eight, uh, we were eight white dudes uh, from France and the US. And um, it seemed great. We moved very fast, but we, we felt that we were going to hit a wall pretty soon. And I would have loved us to be more diverse from, from the start because when you, you're eight or, or 10 white male, it's going to be very hard to to prove to a woman that you are a good place to work. Uh, and um, and it's like, make just a problem worse and worse and worse. So uh, you, you're losing half of the mark of the hiring pool market if you do that. And in Paris, it was very active catch up uh, to no be at around 40-ish percent of, uh, of women in the team, which is not enough, and it's only one side of diversity that is being shared. But uh, I think, especially for us in healthcare, and as Tavet was saying, if you're not diverse in your team, you will not be successful at building a product that is representative to the people you, you you're going to address. And so I would say, uh, you think it's a shortcut to be non-diverse at the beginning because you're going to hire quicker. But I think it's the best way to to lose a lot of time a bit later in the journey. So uh, I would turn to over index to diversity kind of early on from our experience. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to take one last question because we're almost out of time for this topic. So this is a question from Osan. Um, what is the role of training in enabling diversity? For example, uh, trainings for unconscious bias of leadership or executive teams and also leadership uh, coaching programs. Uh, have any of you done these? Have you had an experience with them? How do you feel they play a role? So I'll start with Caroline on this topic. So yeah, we are helping a lot of company uh, to organize their training and unconscious bias first awareness. I think it's super important at the, every level of the company, of course, uh, C-level and manager because they are hiring people and recruiters. Uh, there is a lot of bias in the recruitment process, sourcing, uh, so that's the first point, but that's not enough. And I'm a true believer that we need to have sponsoring internally. When you have diverse background entering the company, we need to have male and female who are sponsoring people. Leadership program is not enough. If you are not changing the culture of the company, that's not possible to progress. So, uh, so first, no bias in recruitment and, and uh, I'm in process, then career pass working on that with no bias. And then you can organize this sponsoring system where you can help women or diverse background to uh, jump at, uh, at the next level. Thank you. And I'll take one last comment. Is there anyone who wants to jump in? Oh, no, I see you're on mute. Go ahead. Yeah, happy to just quickly build on that. I think we have two areas where we, as a tech community, have an opportunity because as Caroline just said, a lot is, is due to culture and how people, uh, how cultures evolve and then what's kind of the, the established way of doing things and uh, therefore we all uh, on this call are, are sort of younger uh, companies in the sc uh, scope of preparing ourselves with with Siemens or, or Telefonica or large companies so therefore I think we have an opportunity of building uh, shifting that culture and then young tech companies have and therefore I think fostering that early on in the culture is really important and I think as uh, Jean-Jean uh, said earlier we also started 
uh, as a team of uh, four white males, I think, uh, uh, and then the first two, so that was the founders, and then uh, there was uh, one or two initial hires also from our friends. Um, so I think one area where we, when we, and I think we're, we're talking not just individual in-company measures, but we're talking European policy here, and I think one area on a policy level which we uh, should be working more into is how can we get more diversity into founding teams already from the beginning and foster female founders because they automatically will the same way how uh, Jean Charles and myself uh, found the first two male friends uh, happen to be your first employees. Uh, they will find uh, their female friends to hire, and then again they they will foster, they will learn, and they will go through that learning journeys as many uh, people on our teams have, and then become great executives in other companies as well going forward. So I think that's um, from a policy level one area, or one lever which we should be pulling more. Super, that's a great comment. Um, on that note, we are going to wrap up this topic on diversity. Thank you guys so much for all your questions and comments, and I hope everybody got a chance to check out the poll. And I'm going to hand it over shortly to Stephanie for the next topic. Thank you, everyone. First of all, thank you for that uh, rich discussion, um, as well as for all the comments that have been posted in the chat and the questions. It'd be terrific if, if we continued um, to keep that up and build from it. So we are now moving on to our second topic, which is um, reinforcing Europe's attractiveness for foreign talent. And so today, there's only about 12% of employees that come to Europe to uh, join startups. So if we want to house the tech giants of the future, what do we need to do in order to attract and retain foreign talent to Europe? So there may be questions and consensus points here, but in essence, what we're trying to understand is how do we increase the attractiveness of the ecosystem and how do we remove barriers along the way in order to um, both attract and retain talent? So we identified four uh, recommendations that came from the initial consultations. Um, the, the, two, the first two consensus points are, have been um, to, I believe we need to move the slide that's showing, I think, is the diversity. Yeah. So the first consensus point is around setting up a European um, reference job platform in order to present a transparent or transparent information around startups development, the development stages, salary and different levels of information about startups in Europe. So creating that transparency via platform. The second consensus point was around creating what we've called a European tech label, which allows for a select group of scale-ups to increase their visibility to others, to candidates uh, and to talent, both within and outside. So those are the two areas where uh, there was a lot of consensus. The ones where we'd like to focus and discuss a bit more in detail today are the two discussion points below. So first one being, should we establish a European tech visa? So a visa that would allow uh, foreigners to come in as well as employees and investors to help the mobility um, of, of uh, foreign talent to obtain residency, to have their per uh, permits, and this would be enabled from an accelerated platform without any sponsorship fees for startup. So that's the first one around the European tech visa. The second is around creating what we're calling a scale-up Erasmus program. And the Erasmus program would allow employees to work for a startup within Europe with a facility or with facilitated procedures um, to enable things like contract, payroll, immigration uh, to be accelerated and to be managed by an intermediary body. So all around you know, an Erasmus program that again uh, increases and encourages mobility. So with that, uh, it would be terrific to hand it over to our panelists for some initial discussions and then we'll then go back to the chat, the Q&A and ask for your feedback as well. But to kick us off, can I ask um, Jean-Charles, would you mind um, talking about some of the discussion points and sharing your views? Yeah, thank you very much, Stephanie, for the introduction. I'm going to be a bit against consensus because it's something that uh, startups do. I don't think the, the two consensus points are going to make a big difference. In fact, uh, they are nice to have, but I don't think that it's going to create the market for people to come. It's not just a better platform and and, and, and job listing like good tech companies, they, they, they know how to market themselves. Um, I think what is really, really important is the two last thing is how you remove friction for a foreigner to come. And if it's super simple, if it's 
simpler than immigrating to the US, but pe people will come to Europe because there are a lot of amazing companies now here. Um, it's about having stock option schemes that work everywhere in Europe and that are fair, which is not the case today. There are so many differences and we try to manage so many different schemes uh, in every country that XMS. And so that Erasmus where you can have employees wherever in Europe, I think it's very strong. We, we have, Alan is live in, in three countries, France, Spain, and, and Belgium, but we have employees in Italy, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Portugal, in the UK, and it's a mess to manage, and it's a mess to, to have a unified uh, scheme. And that, I think, if you can extend the talent pool, make it really easy to work wherever you want in Europe, we, we are going to build a very strong base to be very, very attractive, and that's something nobody else can offer in the world that diversity of countries, that diversity of culture, and the simplification. The last thing, it's immigration process indeed, but it's not only with the state, it's how you open a bank account, how you, you get, can get a flat. And we have seen like so many loopholes in every country where, where I need to host my employees at my flat uh, officially so they can get a bank account, so they can get a flat. Uh, is the kind of things that are just crazy crazy and that we need to simplify or where we need to be focused in my opinion. Super. Thank you for sharing your views. Arcelia, would you mind giving us your perspective? Yes, I agree with Jean-Charles. I think we should consider this. We are a European uh, framework. We are a European environment, which is super attractive. So simplifying the ways to come and uh, uh, providing this support and integrating and all the administration uh, elements is much more difficult to, 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 to be in Italy from this perspective than to be in France. But if we can really uh, smooth out uh, the, the procedures and make people, uh, in particular in this period where really mobility be in a precise place is no longer the point. We, we are learning to work in a different way. So let's use this to make Europe attractive, uh, a Europe that has, uh, I mean, has no borders in this sense with respect to the ecosystem and uh, uh, I absolutely agree with Jean-Charles it's just a matter of make these things simple and I'm sure we'll be uh, we will become extremely attractive because there is uh, uh, what we represent is something quite unique as a, as a European country so I, I, I will uh, I will really uh, strive to make this simplification and have one single framework uh, in terms of procedure, immigration, and uh, all is needed actually to come and work in Europe. Okay, thank you for that. And it seems, I mean, there's a lot of agreement on how we do this in terms of reducing friction and achieving simplification. Um, before I ask uh, additional panelists to comment, um, can I please remind the community and ask to please share your feedback, both in the chat as well as questions, as we'd love to take those on and make sure that we're able to address them today. Um, and with that, um, Hanno, uh, it would be terrific to hear your views, and perhaps as well to the specific recommendations around Tech Visa or Erasmus or other sort of actions that we can do to reduce friction. Anything you can share on that uh, on that point that would be super helpful. I think first of all, to to summarize, I think this is a key point for all of us. It's been mentioned uh, before with with Peter and others. It's it's not a like it really we were restricting ourselves in accessing talent point if we can't uh, to, uh, talent across the world if we can't access them effectively. And for us, uh, we're 700 something people as of today, and uh, there's over a third that comes uh, from international countries outside of Europe, and uh, that shows that it somehow is possible, but is a, a big struggle today and already. And I want to share three quick stories that kind of amplify some points here, uh, and that, that give, give maybe some practical insights. So I think the first one is uh, we oftentimes a lot of our uh, especially on the on the product engineering side, we hire very successfully people from uh, Southern uh, South America and Central America. But oftentimes, where it's a huge pain to provide them with a visa, especially if talented people, for example, only have a bachelor's degree, then sometimes they don't get a get a visa, which is ridiculous because they're well qualified people. We can't find enough good talent here locally anyway, and uh, and therefore it's a struggle that we can't get them. Similarly, we have uh, by now five offices uh, across uh, Europe in different countries, but we're not present everywhere. So, for example, France, where we have customers there, we we uh, so far serve them from from our Dublin or Amsterdam offices, and 
we we still uh, we recently wanted to hire a person there and it was a huge struggle to get someone uh, from Lyon working for us remotely because they uh, we needed to uh, to uh, get uh, without a permanent establishment in France uh, hire them through an intermediary so i think that's also in a european country in a global market uh, or a common market where something that that shouldn't shouldn't be the case and the third one <clears throat> and that adds on the point uh, of Jean Charles uh, as well with regards to option schemes i think that's definitely that shouldn't even be a, a discussion point in my opinion but a consensus point we need a more simplified a more fair uh, employee uh, benefit program because that's less to uh, attract within Europe or from some other countries, but as we also want to compete with the US and want to draw both the best talent from there or talent that otherwise would go there, uh, we also need to be competitive uh, when it comes to option schemes and to fairly have uh, employees participate. So I would therefore agree the European tech is super important. I like the idea of a scale up Erasmus, but I don't think it's, it's crucial. Um, and I think the, uh, the real, big uh, levers besides the tech visa, in my opinion, is a new option scheme and a European uh, fair option scheme. Very clear. Thank you. Before we move to questions, Juan, um, it would be terrific to hear uh, your perspectives as well. Uh, thank you. I mean, I kind of agree more with what has been said. Uh, it, it is great to reduce frictions, visa, uh, and quick access to, to visa is uh, an integral part to it. And then mainly stock options. This is about uh, being competitive with, with other, other markets. Currently, we are not. And specifically with the stock options, it is about complexity, but also about the taxation. Uh, it doesn't make sense that people have to pay taxes before having liquidity, and that happens in many of our markets. And on top of it, it doesn't make sense to um, punish people who receive a stock options versus founders who have a stock from, from the start. And this goes back to diversity. Typically, founders come from very wealthy backgrounds, while employees do not. And we want employees uh, to, to, who come from more diverse backgrounds to go up the ladder. So the first thing we need to do is to treat their gains as capital gains uh, with regards to stock options and, and not to treat those gains as uh, income, income taxes. No, it's really unfair for, for employees and it, it doesn't help on the diversity side down the road. In a matter of five, 10 years, the next uh, a group of founders will come from hopefully companies that, that have done well in the startup scene and if, if they make some money they will be able to to uh, have uh, easier access to, to creating their own companies thank you caroline looks like you're trying to to jump in yeah yeah, yeah. i'm super agree with uh, what Juan said i think it's a key issue for diversity because if you have not enough people uh, in france or germany has a, for example women or diverse background we, we know exactly the country where we have a lot. So Argentina is a great place. Algeria is the first place for women in tech, for example. And if we can simplify, so uh, of course the visa uh, or the remote, and I think we will uh, perhaps talk about that after remote working is a question of uh, fiscality and so on. And we can also expose the benefits of Europe. Uh, so for example, uh, in France, uh, Germany, uh, uh, Spain, school are free. Uh, in France, we have a great aid care. I think it can explain the differences in salaries also. Uh, and we, we need to expose more the benefits of Europe, about this US perhaps, and it can help to attract more, more talents. Uh, and uh, on work-life balance and so on, we have, we have benefits here. So I think it's a great thing to say. Uh, it's not a question of say, hey, we have a visa, it's super free, it's super easy, uh, because we know that it's not only uh, the purpose, it's uh, the salary, uh, what we can offer. So to be more clear, perhaps, about what we can have as a benefit in Europe. Indeed, it is quite multifaceted, <laughs> really understanding what they are and being transparent about what Europe can offer. Fantastic. I believe the only one we haven't heard from on this on these topics in the panels haven't. I think most has been said, so it's very, very hard to add new things. Um, I mean, I agree with Sean Charles at the consensus points. I don't think they will be making a huge difference. Um, what I would add is, I mean, we're living in a world where there is increasing competition between different countries. You know, it's not it's not a it's not just a a dream that people are choosing a country based on where they want to be and what the conditions are. So, you know, London is competing with Paris. I mean, okay, maybe that's a bad example, but Paris competes with Berlin now for talent. And, you know, all the things about tax, stock options, how easy is it to migrate are important. So 
you know, we have to think about how do we make it easy for people to move to Europe from outside of Europe, but also moving inside Europe. You know, things like also work remote work regulation. So there's a lot of tax implications on remote work, which we need to deal with. I mean, that's a lot of this has come to light in the past year now. Um, and maybe the last point to make is when we say, like, we also need to make sure that the people moving moving countries will feel welcome in the countries. So it's about making them, the country making them feel part of it. You know, things like how does their partner find a job? Are there kindergartens for their children, and so on? So it's a, it's a bigger question of how do you make uh, how do you make immigrants feel welcome in the countries they move to? But uh, it needs to be solved if we if we want this to be part of a solution. Now that makes good sense. So thank you, thank you uh, to our panelists for uh, for the first. Uh, um, part of this uh, question. Um, I'd like to just remind the community that there is a poll. We'd love to hear your recommendations and to see the votes at the end. Please participate. Um, and in the meantime, I believe there was a question for Jean Charles that was posted. Uh, Jean Charles, if you don't mind saying, it says, You mentioned you still managed to have quite a few talents incoming from Silicon Valley and that there are ways to make it happen in the current context. Can you please share some of these examples? Um, I, I think for us, it was it was mostly due to the fact that my co-founder was working at Facebook and Twitter in, in, in San Francisco, and we spent a lot of time there. And so we brought back a few people with us, and it created that positive feedback loop. And I think to make it happen, it's a few things. First, show um, uh, that the difference in salaries doesn't lead necessarily to a big difference in in terms of quality of life. Second is to, to really incentivize through equity to make it really easy to uh, to join. So we took care of a lot of things for for, for the people coming from from the US. Uh, it's the mission of the company, obviously. But I would say it's what we discuss is how you remove friction at any time. And it's, the other thing is not being shy, trying to hire there. And that's one thing where sometimes we just block ourselves and, and just reaching out, starting to build a community. And the more you are, the more people talk with each other and, and it's better. So again, it's something that you should try to start sooner than later, I think. That is not easy, where you need some connection on the ground. But when you start the flywheel, it's, it's kind of powerful. But again, it's everything that we have discussed in, about simplification of stock options, and um, one thing that changed in front, which was a strike price of options, uh, where where you you could not have a discount in the past from the last round. Uh, no, you can. Are, are making a huge difference for competitiveness, and that's where we we need to fight, in my opinion. Sure. And on this topic or this question that was posed to Jean Charles, does anyone from the panel uh, have any views that they would like to to add or from their experiences? Okay, we won't, um, we'll move on. Um, and then there's another another question, one last one, I think we, I believe we have time for, which says, could we highlight the top three to five precise friction areas beyond the headline that hinder mobility of talent? And what would be the precise or the specific changes that are needed? Was there someone from the panel who would like to take that? Happy to, to quickly ch uh, jump on that, I think. It's it's a summary of a lot of, of what, what's been said, and of course we, we didn't go in deep policy level uh, uh, um, on that. But I think some of the examples that were mentioned uh, with regards to the stock options uh, not being taxed when people uh, receive them while they're dry income, so they can't deal with it, and the company still go, can go bankrupt, and they will never see money from it. So that's something which which needs to change for a stock option perspective um, equally. Just the ability of a taxation, as, as Juan mentioned. Uh, why should we, as founders, pay different uh, gains uh, on our uh, our shares, which we have much more of anyway than the employees uh, receive? So uh, that's I think an obvious one there. When it comes to the, the mobility, that was sort of the stock option bucket, which we all I think have consensus is a really important one uh, on the part with regards to mobility, really making it easy for people to to get or easier to find or get a visa than than it is for the US. Uh, for example, the, the example I mentioned earlier uh, the, uh, with the bar on what kind of degree do people need to have? I mean, if, if there is a demand for them and if they, they would match the bar of uh, which I think all have high bars towards hiring people, uh, then we should be able to to also provide them with a visa. But also, I think that ability of, of hiring across uh, 
the different countries and, and being able to to have a, a almost and that's something which we haven't mentioned but one idea of a european employment contract where i can hire someone not on a german a spanish french or uh, italian uh, contract but rather on a european one and thereby it doesn't matter and i think that's a segue to our next topic uh, whether they are sitting in madrid in london in in dublin or elsewhere but they can more freely move around uh, without us having to have permanent establishment and these kind of things in the different locations Perfect. Thank you for that. And Ursilia, it looked like you were putting your hand up earlier. Yeah, very quickly, uh, working in international organization, we are also within Europe confronted with uh, attractiveness. You know, we have 60% uh, of uh, people applying to ESA jobs come only from three countries. We are 22 countries. So there is an issue really in having people within Europe moving. Uh, and it's very much relating to, of course, the quality of life that you can offer moving around. So in terms of benefits, but also in terms of the overall setting, family, um, family uh, facilities and how you can make easy people to move around, even if they are not uh, 22, but uh, 30, 30 plus so with uh, uh, with the full equilibrium to preserve but what is also important i'm i'm starting to see uh, that there is a storytelling that is uh, uh, should even change the importance of the values that uh, uh, you bring as a company is also something that can make a shift uh, there is this uh, uh, it becomes more important than before uh, to uh, to belong uh, to a company that is uh, has a posture in society and brings some value there is a, there is a quest for belonging uh, uh, and participating to something that is uh, uh, bigger than, than just the simple business so this is just a way to say let's also consider that uh, uh, the values of diversity, the values of sustainability uh, are values that bring people in and make your uh, company more attractive. Very helpful. Well, thank you to all of you. I believe that's all we have time for on this next topic. And with that, um, I'll hand over to Roxanne. Super, thank you. Um, so now we're moving on to our last topic of the day. We have a little less than half an hour to cover. So this is about how to adapt uh, to employees' new expectations, given how work is changing and uh, the different types of work. And I think especially with the last year, nobody needs a reminder that so much has changed. So in terms of consensus points, um, we have uh, especially freelancing where there was a lot of consensus so encourage freelancing as a valid employment model uh, through favorable regulatory frameworks and inclusion in the European reference job platform. So I think uh, almost a no brainer, but if anybody disagrees, I'd love to hear it. Um, and then to encourage remote work within companies by adapting uh, regulations and company cultures. Um, I'm assuming there's nobody that's gonna be really against remote work, but if there is, please shout out and let us know. Uh, so in terms of discussion, there was really one point, uh, which was to develop certifications such as B Corp and simplify their processes to advertise startups' environmental and social impact. Um, I'd love to hear from how you guys think this has an impact on talent. If you guys think this is essential, if you think there are other points that are maybe more essential. Um, Jean-Charles, I'm gonna start with you. Hi, thank you, Roxanne. Um, I, I think the first two points are, are really important. I, I would like to agree with, with Julian and how we, we make it uh, bold um, and how we can uh, power the, the, the future of work. I think indeed a, a freelancing uh, framework, but it's very connected, in fact, to the previous point, in fact. And I think it's how we build a European framework to have people that can work with you all over Europe and how you can uh, grant them a way to be vested to the company's success. And I'm going back to what uh, Ruan was saying. I think you, you want to distribute the company's success as much as possible to the people that are working with the company, and I think that's what is um, really, really important. After that, um, encouraging remote work, I think it's one of the solutions. We have been a very distributed company um, uh, at Alan, but I, I, I think we can see a lot of many different models, so I would not force it, but again, I would try to go very deep in what are the regulations 
um, that uh, are blocking remote work at scale. Uh, what are the risks companies are, are taking when they do it and how we can remove those risks? I think that what it's what is the most important. On the, on the discussion point on, on B Corp um, environment, I think it's a duty at company level. I would try to ask for diversity and as Tavet shared, I, I, I'm a big believer of, of radical transparency. So um, I, I would just push more uh, companies to be radically transparent on their environmental and social impact. And I think it will help to solve for the better uh, as well. So that's my rough overview. Super, thank you so much. Um, I forgot to remind everyone, uh, obviously, for questions and to respond to the poll. So please make your way over there. Peter, I'd love to hear from you. Um, yeah, we have always seen um, the uh, one of the one of the ways to, to this company that, that I have is built on being able to attract talented people. So all those things um, are essential to win from competition. So I, uh, uh, and the competition for us is globally. So if you talk about, uh, about uh, what you offer to employees, uh, the transparency that we have as a company on our impact strategy, on how we contribute uh, to, um, to charities, um, we've been carbon neutral from day one, uh, so all the way backwards, but I consider that more license to operate. So these are the things uh, um, that we all need to do um, because that will define the power of the company that we built. Um, so I have very little, uh, I have very little to add to this. This, is, this has been the list uh, that we always have been working on from day one. Super, thank you. I'm curious, does anybody think that there's something more important than B Corp uh, that we should add to our list or a certification similar to B Corp? Or do you think that it is necessary to simplify these uh, in order to be able to attack and adapt to, to the future of work? Uh, Juan, I'm gonna go to you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, new generations, um, maybe 20 years ago when people graduated from college, they wanted to go to investment banking or they wanted to do management consulting. But uh, the new, newer generations is more about the purpose of the company and they, they want to have an impact and do something that is relevant to, to them. So I think that uh, that by itself um, levels the, the playing field and now startups are really uh, an exciting place to work for the most talented uh, people around the planet. Uh, whether it is because they belong to a B Corp or because they they are trying to or we are trying to change something specific in in, in our countries, um, I think we, we are that's that's one of our biggest strengths right now with, with regards to to attracting uh, talent. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I can propose uh, anything additional. I think startups are. Um, as, as Peter was saying, the, the, they were carbon neutral from the start. We are setting the standards uh, on, on, on what is to expect from, from a company. And, and uh, new generations have uh, more trust in, in startups than maybe what they do in, in their own uh, governments, given that these startups are aligned with their, their purpose and their principles. No? So I'm not sure I can add much uh, more on this. Super, thank you. Uh, I'll go to Carolyn. Yeah, um, I think the two uh, key points is first flexibility. So remote and freelancing is, of course, one of the big parts of the um, of the new uh, expectation from from employees. But I truly believe that impact is a is a key driver uh, for people from now. They want to know exactly uh, what we will do for society. Uh, what we will do and contribute for climate. So, um, so I, I don't think it's the same level. One is, uh, I think it's a global responsibility that we need to have as a startup at scale up. Uh, when we raise funds, is to organize our company uh, to have a social impact and to have uh, to be uh, really uh, carbon neutral and to contribute to the climate change. I think and really to help on this situation. And on the other side, it's really to really to understand. Uh, what uh, what the, the employee needs now, uh, and and really flexibility is the highest point that they ha are asking. So perhaps it's remote, perhaps just uh, some, uh, a new organization, and we have a lot of women who are now becoming freelance because of that, because they have no option in their own company, so they prefer to go out the company and be, and become freelance in order to organize 
uh, the, the agenda. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Tavit and I kind of want to go a little bit deeper into uh, especially remote work. Um, I think uh, Jean-Charles mentioned a little bit uh, that we need to kind of really work on on, on making the regulation uh, maybe more friendly. Um, Tavit, what are, what are your thoughts on this? I think remote work is an incredibly important part of the future. Uh, we've seen with the last year how a lot can be done remotely and you know, as, I think all of us on this uh, on this event right now will be traveling less in the future, for many for many reasons. However, I don't think remote work is a kind of one answer for everything. Different companies have different cultures. Some companies will be built completely on remote, and that works fantastically well for them. And some companies will be back in the office, and that that works well for them. But I think the key point here is flexibility. You know, you need to, you know. I'm not sure we all need to be in the office five days a week. Like, I personally like to be in the office. I think you know it's a good. It helps me separate work and life and so on. But I don't think I need to do it five days a week, three days a week. I think you know, etc. Like different models will emerge. And you know, something we did at Wise is now we give our employees 90 days where they can work anywhere in the world. I think you know, solutions like this will be incredibly important. But we also need to make sure the world can live with this from a tax point of view and so on. So not quite ready for it today. You know, you might end up in many awkward situations, which will be hard to resolve. And then the simple solution is to ban it all. But that's also the wrong solution. Um, and besides this, you know, Peter mentioned also about climate. You know, I do think that we, the startups and scale ups have an incredibly strong voice. So we need to be showing the way around important topics like climate. You know, that should be part of starting a business that you're starting okay, with a net zero mindset from, from, from the beginning. Okay? Wonderful. Thank you. It's great to know about your 90 days policy too. If anybody else wants to share stuff that they have launched uh, as a result of last year, go ahead. I'm going to move to Hanno. Yeah, so I think the flexibility indeed uh, will change a lot. I think what I would disagree a bit on, on the consensus point, I don't think freelancing is really the biggest uh, issue uh, as of today on the one hand i think it is already possible to to hire a freelancer and then uh, that's probably easier even to uh, than to employ people and sometimes uh, we also have done um, taking the freelance road as an alternative because it was just wasn't possible regulate uh, regulatory to employ someone full-time um, but then of course that also comes with challenges as most of you know uh, however i think with the pandemic a lot of people that have been freelancing also realized that uh, this is much less secure for them uh, and that a lot of them uh, would would maybe also go back into full-time environments but not losing the flexibility is freelancing some people do that because they would like to not have to go to an office or at least not five times a week Week and also maybe spend time 90 days or whatever long uh, at their parents' place. And currently, uh, at least if you take the regulation serious, uh, if, if you're a salesperson that usually is based in, in Dublin, uh, wants to go over Christmas uh, to the, uh, their family in Madrid uh, for a few weeks, then uh, you would have to pay tax there and change a lot of things to make that work. And uh, therefore, most companies just forbid it. And I think that's ridiculous that we can't offer this kind of flexibility of people moving around Europe. And I think that goes back to the point I mentioned at the previous topic with this European passport of allowing people uh, this kind of flexibility and not just by being freelancers, because there I don't think we need to encourage more. That's just happening and it's fine. I think a lot of people will continue to do that. But I think where we really need to, uh, from a policy perspective, improve things is uh, to exactly support these models as um, Tabet Advice, uh, we at Personi and other, many other companies are now implementing, that uh, they are actually also legally compliant and and that we're uh, not having to, to fi uh, fight a lot of bureaucratic huddles to just kind of uh, yeah, follow the demands of our, our people and, and what just a new norm, norm, normality is kind of asking for. Thanks. And before I move to Arcelia to, uh, to conclude uh, this uh, kind of circle that we did with everybody, I just want to remind everyone, uh, please ask your questions. Don't be shy and make sure you respond to the poll. So Arcelia, um, I'll conclude this round with you. Yeah, I will just say that uh, uh, flexibility and being able to provide the elements also for for mobility when needed will probably be uh, one of the most effective uh, way to also increase diversity because there are many invisible barriers that are also relating to the way we work that probably is the time uh, to bring them down. And uh, I, I think this is uh, uh, absolutely in the direction we are saying it's not just 
a good way to uh, to attract and uh, uh, and and to be effective as uh, entrepreneur and startups but will uh, in my view also bring naturally more diversity in the group perfect um we have a, a surprise guest with us now so some of you have seen julian has come on stage Junie, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, if you could please introduce yourself and uh, share with us why we have asked you to be on stage with us. Hi, uh, I'm Julian, a founder of WeFox, uh, which is an, an intro tech um, uh, from Europe. Uh, we, we are around 1,300 people um, based in Berlin, but all across uh, Europe. Um, huge believer in Europe. I, I think we have a tremendous opportunity um, to really make Europe the place to be um, in, the, in the battle for talent. Um, and make Europe the most innovative place. I always say uh, Europe can be the winner of the third data revolution. Um, the second, uh, the internet data revolution was won by the US and, and China. And I think what we've been discussing here is um, very, very important content. And I think the only point that I really want to point out is um, let's not uh, uh, talk about guidelines and let's not talk about recommendations. And let's really talk about bold moves um, that we can make as Europeans in order to um, use the opportunity that we have over the next 10 years to make Europe the most attractive uh, place. And I think um, what France has done um, is tremendous. Um, uh, it is inviting Americans, it is inviting um, Chinese to come work in France. Um, let's uh, invite them to come work in, in, in Europe and use the huge opportunity that we have diversity, um, uh, different countries, um, um, and um, if we align um, our regulations and make bold moves in terms of attracting talent, I think we can win the next 10 years. Super. Julian, don't go anywhere. I want to follow up. Uh, so you're talking about bold moves, and I'd love to hear some reactions from the other people in the panel, but what are the bold moves? Do you have any in mind that you think we haven't heard and that we need to put on our list? Well, I think uh, the, the very important thing is what um, uh, Jean-Charles mentioned. Um, it's let's really use the um, advantage of Europe as uh, one, one market um, and uh, really allow tech companies to hire people first and foremost without any bureaucracy all across Europe and allow them to work from, a, from wherever they went, whether uh, in an um, in a employment or in a freelance uh, relationship. Let's make that first and foremost in a, very, very flexible. Um, but then I think, I think where we can actually also win is what we've seen in the last uh, 12 months, and I think that hasn't been mentioned yet, is how can we give European tech scale-ups access to global talent um, uh, and make it very easy um, for European scale-ups to hire people all across the world, make it much easier for European scale-ups than other companies in the world to hire talent from all around the world. I think the only limiting factor is the time zone, um, uh, and, and Europe has many of them. Um, so let's make um, the access um, to global talent uh, in a very, very easy way, and that's admin, and that's tax, right? And, and I just want to emphasize a point that Hanno and, and John Charles and, and multiple others have brought. The whole topic of stock options is absolutely key we are behind we need to fix it some countries in europe are already doing really well right again i think um uh, you guys in france are doing a, a much better job than us in germany um but let's get um stock options on the top of the agenda thanks julian uh i saw hanno going like this and i see you unmuted do you want to jump in <laughs> oh, i didn't knew i was unmuted but it definitely <laughs> can second what, what, what julian uh, said so I'm not gonna can repeat it. Uh, so the nodding was was <laughs> in agreement. <laughs> All right, Julian, you got a, a thumbs up from Hanno. Um, anybody want to jump in on the bold moves uh, comment? Do we feel that what we have proposed is bold enough? Do we feel that there's something that we need to be be pushing more? Juan, you want to take this? Um, I, I think I exhausted my list of uh, suggestions already. <laughs> All right, well, good. As long as we have all the answers we need, we're good. Uh, Peter. Yeah, I think there's one thing in this discussion, which uh, um, if you compare Europe to uh, other parts of the world, it's that talented people are often already uh, moving to the area in an earlier stage uh, for uni when they go to university or education. And um, I think that, that if you talk about bold moves, that will be fantastic if uh if we can get people here at an earlier stage if we if we can make our education system um, um, um 
if we can make our and that's also very different per countries but having top universities in europe accessible for uh, people from all over the world that would that would get talented people here uh and and now we're talking about how we get them if they have been educated elsewhere and educated does need to be through university obviously that's only a part of it because we have a lot of people that are very talented uh that 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 that, that learned uh sometimes in very different ways uh, uh, got their skills but for the university trained people i think that's one that we uh, that we really uh, that we really miss out on sometimes because people go to other universities outside of Europe. That's a very good point. Um, Tavid, I see you have unmuted. I'm wondering if you want to jump on the same topic or a different one? Um, along the same line. So I, I do think that if we could uh, plant the flag saying we are going to be the most welcoming to talent who wants to come here and help build the tech ecosystem, you know, it could, it could be something that will separate us from other parts of the world. So embracing talent that wants to come to Europe should be a, a big slogan we put on the continent. We wrap the continent in the slogan and we'll make it easy for great people to, to come in. I love that idea. Um, I'm wondering, is are we, are we talking university level? Are we talking earlier? I think university, are we not attracting already a lot of people from abroad? Caroline. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I believe that the university for now, for example, in France, we have a lot of international talent, not during COVID, of course. <laughs> we'll see after that. Uh, but we are attracting talent from everywhere because uh, we have a great school. And so they're coming in UK, they're coming in France, they're coming, I don't know, for Germany, but we have like great school here. So I don't know if that that point really important to have like more international international uh, talents coming uh, coming in our companies. Uh, I truly believe that uh, the first part was about the visa. Uh, it's a, it's a, because we we do not need only international talent. We need people coming from perhaps more advanced ecosystem uh, and and come with uh, with experience and so on. So I uh, I truly believe that we need um, talents with an experience before. Uh, and it camps with uh, with other ideas, uh, with other way of working, and perhaps perhaps education is a little bit too <laughs> too young. So it's important to have international talent in our university and to to share our culture and perhaps to be uh, good in soft power such as U.S. and perhaps China. <laughs> but uh, I truly believe that experience before and culture that you can experience in your workplace is super important. Super, thank you. And I think we'll conclude this topic on with Jean-Charles. You wanna finish on a, a word about education, uh, bringing people over earlier? Indeed, education is really important. When I just look at my engineering school in France, it was less than 20% women. So it's going to solve a lot of topics on diversity. Uh, obviously, if we manage to go earlier in the journey, but we should not use that as an excuse. It's not, a, we have to wait for education to be great to solve it. We, we need to over-index on diversity, removing friction everywhere. So we are the most attractive place uh, in the world. And in parallel, invest severely in education, in communication about STEM everywhere. I do, I, I do agree. Uh, but um, sometimes we, we can hide be, be behind the fact that uh there is not enough supply and i think we should uh, over just fight against against that in in many ways and and i hope that the success of tech companies in europe and and peter with Agen is one of uh the leading example will bring more people to the field will get uh people more excited and and that i think is our hope not the job and i think the job of that discussion today is how we improve regulation and we simplify things to, to make it easier. If we do that, I, I, I tend to believe in the market that we will be attractive because we build the right companies. Perfect. I think that's a great note to end on. This has been a really great topic. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts. I want to thank uh, our amazing panelists. So Tavid, Hanno, Peter, Juan, um, and Caroline. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie to conclude. And don't forget, everybody who's participating, to vote in the polls. And hopefully we will see the polls and the results. Fantastic. So thank you everyone for taking the time um, to express your views.
see the results of the polls here. On um, the first topic, which was around promoting diverse talents, uh, the, the highest rating one would have been a European diversity rating for startups. The second one around what we can do to uh, reinforce Europe's attractiveness for foreign talent, uh, that with very high scores, 62% recommending a European tech visa. And then on the last one, how we can adapt the ecosystems to employees' new expectations, such as remote working and mission-oriented companies, following on from this last question, come up with remote work by adapting regulations and changing company cultures. So thank you again for your feedback, and hopefully this gives you a bit of a sense of what the community is at. And with that, I believe I'm handing over to closing remarks from Ursilia and jean -Claude. Thank you. I, I just want to say that has been a terrific discussion, a lot of ideas, uh, bold ideas. And uh, I really believe we are uh, at the verge of, uh, of a big change. Also, I mean, take into account uh, the way we have uh, uh, experienced working in this uh, last year. So remote work in the future work will open up to new opportunities. Flexibility will be one of the uh, main topics. So let's really invest in these things. Let's uh, uh, leverage uh, on these aspects uh, because Europe should be the place to be. And I'll just end with optimism. When I see the people around the table, the ideas, the willingness from companies and, uh, and states to improve the setup, I think we can be really optimistic to be able to change the future and to make Europe more attractive. So I'm just really glad and, and thankful and humbled that we can have that, those discussions as a group, that we don't make a competition between France, uh, Germany or Spain, and that we have a European uh, view to do it. I think that is really, really powerful if we want to, to be successful. Uh, and we are beating some uh, so, some theories of game theories there. So, so, so that's great to do that together. I don't know who is supposed to close, but if it's me, thank you, everyone. <laughs> it was an amazing session. I'm looking forward to the results. Uh, OK, I, su I suppose it's uh, up to me. S thank you very much, Jean-Charles. I, I, I love the, the game theory. Uh, I love the discussion. Thanks, you to, thanks to all. Uh, just uh, to, to, to conclude and to say uh, that we are, you are invited to the next uh, workshops. We are still workshops on to come on deep tech and uh, uh, cooperation between corporates and startups to uh, exciting subjects and also investment, also very important, of course. And let's not forg forget the finish line, which will be a physical event in mid-June to present uh, the final report, the manifesto to uh, uh, President Macron. Uh, we will share with you all the details, of course. So thanks again and stay tuned.